Boy, I sure love country living. Ice fishing, like in the olden days. Ooh, ooh. I got a bite. Wait a minute, it's not a fish. That's Tom Woods, like in the olden days. I know, I know, I fell on the ice again. How long was I out this time? Well, from the looks of that dingy lion pelt, I'd say about 10,000 years. What? 10,000 years? Michael, can we go to your bathroom? I gotta take a dinosaur-sized dump. So why would we talk about modern capitalism? Everybody seems to hate it, but the answer is that it's the system that has lifted more people out of poverty than anything else in the history of the world. We're always taught that capitalism impoverishes people, taking from the poor and giving to the rich, and it produces hunger and hopelessness. When people say impoverished, what they really mean in actual terms is not having enough resources to buy the very basic things that every being needs to survive. They mean food, they mean clean water, they mean medicine, they mean shelter. And by that standard, we have the data. The numbers are in, and the amount of people without access to those things, no matter how much their local currency, was cut in half in the last 20 years. This was not in spite of capitalism, but because of it. 20 years! That's one generation. As a matter of fact, Americans were recently polled and asked, what do you think has happened with poverty around the world over the past 20 years? Do you think it's doubled? Do you think it's stayed roughly the same? Or do you think it's been cut in half? 95% got it wrong. Why? Nobody's giving them the truth. They're all led to think that everything's getting worse. Because, of course, we already know it's getting worse because capitalism is evil. We've already got the narrative before we even look at the facts. There's a huge incentive for people who spread news to make things seem as bad as possible. We don't have stories about, no one's hungry, everyone has clothes. Instead, it's, look at this starving kid. The glorious thing is that starving kid used to be everywhere on Earth. And now, it's getting harder and harder to find him. By the way, Michael, I'm starving. I've been stuck in ice. You're not going to offer me anything? Well, what do you want? I've got ham from Spain. I've got sashimi from Japan. I've got Canadian bacon. I've got sausages, burgers, dumplings from the motherland, and for dessert, Cadbury cream eggs. Whatever you want, it's no big deal. Not a big deal? What are you talking about? You have food and delicacies from all over the world. Your pantry is full of delicious food from around the world that probably most kings and queens would have killed to have. You ever stop to think about how that's possible? Okay, Boomer. I went on Amazon and showed up at my door. Amazon? Look, I'm just a simple caveman. How about we go back one step beyond that? How did it get to your door? How did it get to the place that brought it to your door? Where did this all come from? A hundred years ago, we were all Oliver Twist saying, Please, sir, may I have another bowl of gruel? Now, the problem is you have so much food, you have childhood obesity. You have honey boo-boo. Yeah, it's still a problem. But it's a much better problem to have kids who are going to have too much food than those who are going to be stunted in their growth and are even starving to death. Look, if 95% of Americans believe something that's factually inaccurate, that can only be a function of the organizations that are providing them with this misinformation. There's an economist named Bob Lawson who specializes in the economic freedom of different countries of the world. What he found is that the more capitalist a country, the fewest deprivations that people are suffering, which is the exact opposite of what everyone has been told. Every famine in the last 30 years worldwide has been a function of there being food for hungry populations more than they could need. Governments or criminal gangs, but I repeat myself, have kept them from having access to that food. Whether it's Ethiopia, whether it's North Korea, whether it's Somalia. They're all specific examples of them not allowing food to reach the specific population. <laughs> Michael, people will say you can't just hand wave childhood obesity. They'll say that if there's so much food, that implies a lot more people eating the food and more people, period. And when you have that many people, it's going to destroy the earth. We can't sustain that many people. Thanks, capitalism. You just caused a new problem, overpopulation. At least that was the thesis of Stanford ecologist Paul Ehrlich, who wrote books laying out catastrophic scenarios for the future of mankind and the Earth. Ehrlich thought overpopulation was a major problem because we were using so many resources they were going to suddenly run out 
setting us up for a system-wide collapse. Now, Julian Simon, who's another economist, thought Ehrlich was 100% wrong to worry about this. In Simon's book, The Ultimate Resource, he points out that more people means more minds. And these are minds which are capable of innovating, minds which are capable of solving problems. So more people isn't a bad thing. It's more of the most productive resource in history, the human mind. And there's a famous bet between these two. So Simon says to Ehrlich, all right, if all these people are draining resources, you pick five metals that you think we're going to run out of, or because we're going to be running out of them, they're going to be prohibitively expensive and prices will shoot up as with anything that becomes scarce. And over the next 10 years, we'll see if those prices go up or go down. If it goes up, they're getting more scarce. If it goes down, they're getting more abundant. And you can pick them. Again, Simon let Ehrlich pick the metals. So Ehrlich went ahead, he picked his five metals, and guess what? The price of every single one of them fell. And he ended up having to write Julian Simon a check. And Simon had that check displayed on his wall until the day he died. And by the way, Michael, it's not like Julian Simon is saying that we're going to discover more of these metals necessarily. It could mean that human innovation either finds a better resource than these or just figures out how to use them more efficiently. We've been through this in the past. In 1920, people were saying, oh, we've only got 20 years left of oil. In 1940, oh, there's only 20 years left of oil. Now, two things are happening. One is they're finding more oil, but they're also developing new ways to make the oil that we do have more effective. If I invent an engine that uses one-tenth the oil to run a car, I have effectively increased the amount of oil in use tenfold. And that is what Julian Simon was referring to when he referred to the human mind as the ultimate resource. Matt Ridley, a famous science writer, puts it this way. Mobile phones have the computing power of room-sized computers of the 1970s. I use mine instead of a camera, radio, torch, compass, map, calendar, watch, CD player, newspaper, and pack of cards. LED light bulbs consume about a quarter as much electricity as incandescent bulbs for the same light. Modern buildings generally contain less steel, and more of it is recycled. Offices are not yet paperless, but they use much less paper. And even in cases when the use of stuff is not falling, it's rising more slowly than expected. So experts in the 1970s forecast how much water the world would consume in the year 2000. In fact, the total usage that year was half as much as predicted. Not because there were fewer humans, but because human inventiveness allowed more efficient irrigation for agriculture, the biggest user of water. Okay, we have a lot more people, and we're feeding them. But when you have more people, and more people are getting food, and more people need housing, and more people need space, that means there's less food, there's less housing, and there's less space for every other animal that has to live on this earth. You commonly hear human beings are putting a strain on the natural environment and on the other species living on this planet with us. Now that makes sense as a story, but we do have enough information to show that that's not how things really play out in real life. In the U.S., there have been some big extinctions. You had the Rocky Mountain locust, you had Carolina parakeet, you had the passenger pigeon. But these were all 100 years ago. Since then, conservation became a major issue in the West. In America, this was pioneered by Teddy Roosevelt. Now it's done through governments, but it's also done through organizations like the NRA and hunting organizations across the board. There is a consensus that species need to be preserved for future generations. When you have wealth, that wealth is used to preserve things that are rare and valuable and special. When you don't have wealth, those rare and valuable and special things become a resource. The conventional wisdom that capitalism damages the environment because all these profit-seeking businesses are thinking about nothing but the bottom line is wrong. And so is the idea that meanwhile we consumers, consuming all this great abundance, are sucking up resources and depriving the creatures we share the earth with of the resources they need. Let's make the most extreme comparison we have. I'm going to compare the U.S. versus China, where people have their own organs harvested, where they're a resource. You have animals that have been symbols of Chinese culture for centuries. Look at the paddlefish. We have a paddlefish here in America that's so plentiful, its caviar is being used as a replacement for Russian and Iranian caviar. 
the Russians and the Iranians are doing the same things that the Chinese did. The Chinese hunted the Chinese paddlefish, one of the largest freshwater fish in the world, to extinction. Here, we're breeding paddlefish. The second is the Baiji, which is the Chinese river dolphin. Driven to extinction by pollution and other reasons, they called it the goddess of the river. That goddess is gone. A prosperous country will do everything in its power to make sure that nature is preserved. You have the bald eagle, which has gone from being on the verge of extinction to being least concerned. Let's look at the panda. Let's look at the panda, one of the great symbols of contemporary China. Pandas are not allowed outside of China except as a loan from the Chinese government at a huge cost to zoos. The Chinese government isn't interested in setting up breeding colonies in other countries to preserve this very rare, special, and unique species. They want to keep it scarce and a monopoly so they make as much money as possible. That is very dangerous for the long-term survival of the panda. Species want to live, they want to reproduce as much as possible to grow their population. They've evolved for this for millions of years. The vicuña, cousin to the llama, in 1974, they were declared endangered. There were just 6,000 left in all of South America. Just 6,000. 45 years later, after they became protected, there's 350,000. If you protect a species, they tend to rebound very, very quickly. What it boils down to is that private owners of resources tend to want to preserve the long-term capital value of the things they own. So if you own, let's say, a small pond, you don't fish all the fish out of it in the first year because you know that in year two you'll have no fish left. The tragedy of the commons is when you have a pond with no owner. So there's nobody who can capture the value of the pond in year two, year three, year four. There's no owner. So everybody tries to grab as many fish out of that pond in the first year as possible because if they don't, it's not that those fish will just be waiting for them in the second year and they will have multiplied into more fish. Other non-owners who are just there to grab and not think about the future will just grab those fish. And the result is resource depletion. So you want more private ownership of more resources if you really want to preserve the long-term value and health of those resources. One of the big ironies of capitalism is that people have more time to notice things that could be improved. If you're not spending as much time worried about your next meal, if you're not spending as much time worried about the roof of your head, if you're not spending as much time thinking, how could I possibly afford a second pair of shoes? Things lose perspective as a function of how big of a problem they really are, especially as compared to how they were in the not so recent past. Boy, modern medicine sure has made kidneys valuable. Is that my kidney? Correction, it was your kidney. <laughs>